Welcome back. It's time now for On the Radar, where we ask an investing professional what they're looking at in today's markets. We're back again with Lenka Martinek. She's managing partner at Sustainable Market Strategies, Nordisk Capital, to talk about artificial intelligence. And you've got a novel uh, take on this. Uh, you've looked at uh, the energy consumption of high-end AI applications. Yeah, so um, I just wanted to continue this morning on this electricity. We talked about electric vehicles, another area um, of massive um, demand for electricity is coming from artificial intelligence, of course. And so, um, you know, we had this massive run, this really nice run up in a lot of AI related, some would call it a bubble in mm -hmm. AI related stocks in 2023. Um, if we think about the sort of hype cycle around technology, uh, we're starting to wonder whether 2024 might be a year where we sort of go into a bit of a trough of disillusionment, as they call it in the Gartner uh, hype, hype cycle. And um, when we think about what are some of the reasons why, you know, artificial intelligence might fail us or whether it might be a little bit of downside, um, of course, we have a lot more concerns uh, just over the past month in terms of, you know, deep fakes and things like there was use some pretty interesting memes going around about some some pictures of, of Trump and others um, that have been created by AI and so there's this discussion obviously around things like privacy you know transparency honesty all of these sorts of things but there's another one and of course it's it's again coming back to energy and electricity so artificial intelligence pro, uh, takes uh, just enormous amounts of, of power um, the statistic that I like to share is that a, 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 a query on chat GPT takes about 10 times more than just a simple Google search mm -hmm. so if you're wa wanting to know very simple things that Google can answer for you um, it's uh, it's less much less energy intensive than asking chat GPT and so, you know, the question is, so we started actually looking at, you know, how much energy is, you know, how energy demand is changing, where is it coming from? Um, and one of the things that we uncovered is that in North America over the last five or 10 years, actually the um, energy demand is forecast has always been about flat between zero and a half percent um, for the entire sort of grid system and the reason for that is as the population grows actually we're getting more energy efficient and so we end up not really using on a on a macro scale much more energy but in the last three or four months the um, the forecast for energy consumption have just skyrocketed have gone up for to about five percent over the next five years so this is quite a big you know, rate of change or change compared to what uh, forecasters were previously expecting. And the idea here is where is that demand coming from? Well, obviously, it's coming from, you know, things like electric vehicles, electrifying our transport sector. It's coming from, um, you know, more uh, buildings being uh, heated uh, by electricity rather than uh, fossil fuels. And then the third one, the big one, is really data centers. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a part, of course, it can be cryptocurrencies, it can be artificial intelligence. But we're really seeing an explosion in demand coming from, from this sector. Um, and so how as an investor can can you play this? So as you as you know in the electricity sector, you have the the you know the power, the generation, you have transmission and distribution. And so um, you know 2023 was not a nice year, was not a pleasant year for renewable energy stocks in general because of the higher interest rate environment. Um, but what we are noticing is this story about the demand of the transmission. You know, once you have your power, how do you get it to how do you get it to where it's needed, to, yeah. to the data centers, to the houses, et cetera, et cetera? And it comes through transmission. So who's going to benefit from that? Well, we think it's really the, the, the suppliers of the cables, uh, the connectors, et cetera, et cetera. So we're looking at companies like Prismian Group, uh, Nexens, ABB. PRY is the first ticker symbol. Exactly. Maybe, maybe we can get that up on the screen. Go ahead. Yeah, it was just to say that basically I think this story about this, um, this uh, the amount of energy demand that is going to need to be connected to the grid is um, is really starting to, is, is just starting to be sort of become well known. And so we're seeing that, uh, we've seen both of those two companies, Nexens and, and Prismian, um, they've had their, uh, a nice little bounce in, in stock prices recently as we sort of, you know, it doesn't matter if it's renewable energy or coal or what it is, but that energy has to get it to the grid, you need these companies. Uh, what do you think of the copper miners? Uh, th they may be challenging from the point of view of, a, of somebody focused on sustainable investing, but you can't expand the grid without copper? What do you yeah. think of the copper miners, like tech like tech resources, for instance? Yeah, so, well, I actually like tech. Uh, we don't have, we don't hold it in our portfolio. We don't hold it even in our sustainability universe because of the exposure to coal. Um, but the day that, um, you know, well, we can see that tech is trying very hard to, to you know, to, to divest from the coal industry. Um, and once, you know, if that happens, I think the, the copper assets of, of tech are, are very, very strong. Um, we are, you know, we would like 
like to we would like to be owners of uh, of copper mines as much as possible because it's one of the uh, clearly one of the um, materials that we're going to need to electrify. Um, again, it sort of you have to take into context where we are in terms of the business dynamics and the business cycle. Copper is uh, under four dollars at the moment. Um, you know, I. If, if I had a crystal ball on the on the on the economic cycle, I'd have be a little bit more um, bullish, I guess, on 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 metals at the moment. Um, but as a long term play, obviously, um, looking for copper miners um, that are um, that have good ESG practices, because of course, as a sustainability investor, it's nice to like the product, but you have to really be very very careful, especially in the mining sector, about things like worker treatment, environmental policy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and of course, we had that um, the. The, uh, the Canadian miner in Panama uh, yeah, that got first quantum exactly. Yeah. Um, so these types of you know ESG issues uh, you need to be very very careful about. Okay, the three stocks that Lenka likes here are all European stocks. Uh, Prismian Group P R Y trades in Italy. Uh, Nexens uh, ticker symbol N E X trades in Paris, and A B B is a Swiss traded stock. Well, Canadian Pacific Kansas, Kansas City is out with its fourth quarter results. And uh, when it comes to adjusted earnings per share, uh, it came in at $1.18. That is up 3.5% uh, compared to the same quarter a year ago. Um, to dig into the results further with us, though, is Steve Hansen, Managing Director and Equity Analyst with Raymond James. Steve, always great to get your context on these uh, railroads. Uh, it, it's super helpful. So what's jumping out to you so far from uh, CP, CPKC's latest results. Yeah, I agree with you, Jacqueline, as always. I'd say, you know, the numbers, as you suggest, uh, were quite quite impressive for the quarter, uh, certainly well ahead of expectations. I think it's important in context here is coming into this back half of last year, uh, the railroads had been under quite a bit of pressure from a volume standpoint. Uh, expectations had been actually higher heading into fourth quarter on volume, but they came in a little bit lower in the low single digit range. And ultimately, though, the earnings certainly are, are coming in well ahead of expectations, which is positive news. And you were you were expecting this when it came it comes to uh, both CP and CN this year. You were thinking things that might uh, turn a bit of a corner? Yeah, that's right. So again, if you look back, like we had a very difficult year last year, hyper volatile traffic pattern. The second, third quarter in particular were really difficult for both the Canadian railroads. Uh, traffic was in decline, revenues had been falling, ORs or operating ratios had been pushing higher, and ultimately both carriers even cut guidance for the year. Now, the fourth quarter was really started to turn the corner, though we started emerging signs of strength in the traffic pattern. Traffic turned positive for both carriers, which was encouraging to us. And we think the outlook ultimately carries here through 2024, uh, with the small caveat that there will be uh, a few speed bumps here in the first quarter, given some of the weather we've seen here in Canada and some tough comps. Okay, so, uh, you know, poor weather, uh, extreme cold, that kind of thing? Yeah, that's right. We had some really extreme temps up here, uh, particularly through the prairies, uh, negative 40, even negative 50 in some cases. And when that happens, you really have to chop down the train length to make it work. And when that mm -hmm. happens, you lose a lot of economies of scale. But we're through that now. Even the traffic last week is a demonstrated uh, real sharp rebound, which is encouraging. And as we look into the back half of Q1 and certainly into Q2-3, for 24, the comps fall away, and we think the traffic accelerates. Well, that's really interesting. I, I didn't know that about needing to, to shorten the train in, uh, in cold weather. Um, when you're looking ahead to this year, though, I just wonder, aren't uh, companies like, uh, you know, rail companies like this, um, a good sort of indicator of the economy? So, you know, wouldn't it be reflective of what, um, you know, the broader expectation for the economy is? Yeah, you're right. I mean, railroads are often sort of described as barometers for the economies. That adage is true, still holds. But there are a lot of nuances to the traffic patterns that are worth noting. As we look into 24 specifically, we see a lot of strength in the bulk categories, in particular coal and potash. Grain will be a big headwind to start the year. We had a difficult harvest in Canada, unfortunately, last fall. But grain and potash, or sorry, potash and coal both look good. And then we look into the merchandise categories, intermodal in particular, which is that consumer sensitive piece of traffic where we pull imports from offshore. That was a brutal headwind through all of last year. And it's just turned positive again. So again, the railroads cannot escape the economy. They are true barometers, but ultimately we see better traffic growth as the year progresses. And and maybe, you know, the fact that the comparisons <laughs> Are, might be positive or might be good if it, if it was such a rough year it could um, make things look uh, maybe a bit rosier as well, Steve? 
Yeah, we think so. Uh, you know, again, we had brutal headwinds through last year, not, not just on the volume side, but again, in some events uh, related issues. If you remember, uh, forest fires or wildfires across the country, mm -hmm. we had a big port right here in Western Canada that was extended over two weeks. Uh, we also had some flooding events. So really everything that could go wrong went wrong through the mid part of last year. We're not expecting that to repeat. And as that sort of carries through, we think we get good operating leverage for the railroads. They, they really do perform best when traffic is increasing. It's interesting, um, you know, despite all the headwinds that you talked about for, for last year, when we look over the past year, the uh, CP's shares are essentially flat. They're up about 3%. Um, I wonder what you think investors will make of, of these latest results um, and, you know, the potential road ahead here for CP. Yeah, you're right. And so the one thing to keep in mind here is they've just gone through a very uh, transformational merger. So what used to be Canadian Pacific is now Canadian Pacific Kansas City. Um, and so we've now got an integrated network that extends not just across Canada, but right down through the heart of Mexico. And, and it really was the revenue synergies that was keeping the market optimistic last year, despite the traffic pain I described it. I think the good news is now is with these fourth quarter results, as you described, uh, better fluidity, better uh, speed, if you will, on the network, uh, reduced congestion. We'll really look forward to some of those revenue synergies from the transactions starting to flow on the network, which is, is part of the optimism here in the, from an investor standpoint. Steve, always a great to have you join us on a day like this. Thanks so much for making the time. As always, a pleasure. That was Steve Hansen, Managing Director and Equity Analyst with Raymond James. With all that said, get some more live perspective now. Tom Purcelli joining us. He's Chief U.S. Economist at PGM Fixed Income. Tom, it's great to have you with us. Um, you know, when you think about what the Fed has to manage and what it has to say to the markets, given all these considerations, what should we be thinking about on this Fed day? Yeah, look, uh, so good to be with you as always. Um, I, I think the Fed is um, in a... <laughs> look, if Powell was... Um, he's thinking about this strategically. <laughs> I think he wants to hit one straight down the middle today. I mean, I... Uh, I don't think there's any reason to deviate. Um, I, I think he has sort of the market, I think, right where, where he wants it, which is to say, you know, March cut odds are right around a coin flip. I think that's probably the right place for them to be. Um, I, I, and, and I think his commentary today, I think, will be reflective of that. There are a couple of things that they need to, um, a couple of changes they need to make to the statement. Um, there's a, a phrase in there that, that talks about, you know, a, the possibility of additional policy firming is the exact phrase. That can get removed, and I think most people are expecting that. And I think that that would be sort of the next step um, in what is going to be the eventual um, rate cuts to come. And you know, when we talk about plans for rate cuts, um, uh, obviously inflation remains one of the big considerations. How's the inflation yeah. fight going? We got some more data today uh, already um, that maybe gave us a, a, a little clue on, on on that front. How would you characterize? Yeah what the, uh, the inflation picture looks like in the United States right now. Yeah, yeah the, the inflation fight is over. I mean, the, the Fed will keep on saying uh, that they're fighting it. And, and I think they, you know, they want to continue to press that narrative. Because if you look at the year-on-year -year pace, the year-on-year -year pace, sure, it's still elevated relative to target. But by almost any other um, calculation, right, which, you know, three months, six months, um, you're, you're now either at the target or you're below the target. So. I think the Fed wants to continue to sort of press this idea of, yeah, you know, look, we're obviously want to be, um, you know, sort of focused on inflation and et cetera. But I think by almost any measure, um, in, in the inflation story um, is is done in terms of it being a real worry. And I think that's what really opens up um, the Fed to cut rates. I mean, it's 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 interesting. I was just having this conversation um, with with someone here at PGM. All roads lead to cuts. Right. Whether you believe in a recession or you believe in, you know, sort of this soft landing, um, you're going to get cuts. That's an obviously an atypical setup. Um, but policy is entirely too restrictive, even if you believe in a soft landing. It, policy is entirely too restrictive for inflation that's now back to target and even below target, depending on how you look at it. Um, and growth that is clearly slowing down. So cu cuts are coming now. I think it's a question of, of, of degree slash depth. We also uh, ran some commentary from David Rosenberger with us yesterday just talking about some of those uh, actions taken by the U.S. federal government on stimulus, which are, you know, help out. I don't, at the end of the day, like, there's all sorts of stuff that helps an economy to remain resilient. I don't know if we need to sort of c cut it up, um, you know, slice and dice it um, um, yeah. 
to, to determine um, whether or not a resilient economy is, is, is another reason uh, with the inflation fight improving to, to cut rates. But is there is there an argument to be made that without that, that the economy might actually look a little bit weaker and that that would also play into the idea of lower interest rates? Yeah, I mean, there, there's no question about that. Fiscal stimulus has been hugely helpful. I mean, if you know, if you strip out um, the impact from um, all the excess saving that we've seen over the course of the last you know year or two, um, growth would have looked very different. In fact, it, it wouldn't have been growth last year. I mean, you would have had actually a, a, a pretty decent recession um, if not for all of the the, the stimulus. Um, so yeah, I do. I think that that's fair. Now, again, do I think that the economy can sort of hang in there, um, particularly this year? Um, I do. I think that uh, the consumer can certainly hang in there um, for the moment. There are still pockets of excess saving. I mean, look, you could break down excess saving into the sort of the different income quintiles. But the reality is, even within the quintiles, um, there are going to be, you know, some households that retain some um, some of the excess saving. Um, so some of that is out there. I wouldn't put too much weight on that. I think the thing that you sort of we're acutely aware of as it relates to the consumer's ability to continue to press forward is the fact that the credit spigots are pretty open. I mean, we keep on hearing about lending standards that are tightening, but only 30 percent of, of banks have tightened lending standards. I'm not saying that's small. I'm simply saying that's not big. Um, and I think that that becomes a sort of a, you know, this the next pool that the consumer can dip into. I think the thing that really gets the consumer to sort of uh, um, scale back, um, you really need to see labor start to slow down. And despite what jobless claims might tell you, the reality is cyclical hiring has slowed. Um, that has been sort of, uh, um, we've been acutely aware of that um, for the last several months. So I think that's, that, that's the next leg. Um, because when I look at incomes, spending relative to incomes, you're like way off the line, right? Uh, you know, s uh, spending is uh, s significantly outstripping income. Um, and that was um, aided and abetted by fiscal stimulus. Right. And to your point, like the employment picture, uh, sometimes it lags. And, you know, as we hear about more and more challenges potentially on that front, that's going to be giving us a, a further indication. Tom, good to see you. Thanks very much. We'll be watching that Fed decision later Thanks. today. Tom Porcelli joining us as the chief U.S. Uh, economist at PGM Fixed Income. The mustard market was tight in 2021 in large measure because of drought in Western Canada. The French, for example, they were crying out for mustard seeds to make their famous Dijon mustard. However, it's a different story this year. It looks like Canada could have a crop of about quarter of a million or almost quarter of a million tons, and that's likely to push down prices. Meanwhile, plenty of mustard is coming from other regions, such as Russia. We're joined by Chuck Penner. He's the president of Left Field Commodity Research. Chuck, thanks very much for coming on the show. Good to be here. Just remind us, how big is mustard for Canadian farmers? Well, it's a big deal for farmers in certain parts of the prairies. Uh, mustard tends to grow in the driest parts of the prairies, where even canola struggles. So in those areas, for those farmers, it's an important part of their crop rotation. That's interesting, and I suppose may become more important uh, if the conditions get dr drier in years to come. Mm -hmm. There were good times in terms of mustard prices in 2021. The price went up sharply. Yeah, it's been a real roller coaster. So, uh had been quite stable up until then. And, and then, of course, production dropped sharply to about 60,000 tons. And so that's uh, that's less than half of what an average crop is. And so it caused prices to jump to, uh, for some types of mustard, to around $2 a, a pound. Oh. And so those kind of prices are, are now in distant memory, although farmers are still thinking about those. <laughs> but this year's crop, compared to the 21 crop of 60,000 tons. This last year's crop was about 170,000 tons. So almost triple what the size of that crop was. So that's that's the caused the roller coaster type of movement in prices. And in 2023-24 we could get close to 240,000 tons from Canada. Well, uh, I think that's probably a little optimistic, oh, okay. but but certainly this next year, we're, we're looking at another sizable crop, and then we're going to be carrying over some of last year's crop as well, too. So we're going to have quite large supplies, and so supplies might be around that 250,000 ton mark. And But people, they, they won't be getting anything near $2 a pound. It might be closer to $0.60 cents a pound. 
Yeah, some types of mustard, brown mustard, there's there's various types. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so brown mustard prices are now around 40 cents. Uh, so it's uh, it's it's been quite a a uh, quite a ride, I say, I guess you could call it. Walk us. We're going to get a great. We're getting a great mustard tutorial here. So we've got the yellow mustard. <laughs> a lot of that goes to the U.S. I guess that's that school bus mustard. Then we have the brown mustard. The Europeans like that. And then we have the Oriental mustard, which is the spicy stuff. Um, is Canada particularly big in any of those three types? Yeah, the the yellow mustard is is in a typical year is about half of the crop. And so, like you said, that goes down into the U.S. That's the stuff you squirt onto your hot dogs and and so on. And uh, so that's been, yeah, about half of the crop. Uh, And then about another uh, 30% would be the brown mustard going to Europe. And then the last little bit is is this oriental mustard that that typically goes to Asian markets. Uh, And there's a bit of crossover. It's not strictly in each of those markets, but that's generally where they go. So, uh, yeah, it's been, uh, it's, um, each crop, each mm-hmm. type of, of mustard has its own very specific market. Is the brown mustard used for Dijon mustard, for example? That is one of the one of the types that's used in there, mm-hmm. um, and all it also goes into some of the uh, German prepared mustards, oh, yeah. the whole grain mustards, uh, those types of things. So it's um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's a uh, it's a fascinating market. Uh, oh, yeah. You may not think so, uh, some, some people may not think so, but it's it's fascinating actually. I'm in the school that says mustard should be a little painful. I like the Coleman's or the Keens. Is that the strong Oriental mustard? Um, not necessarily. It could be the brown mustard. Uh, part of it is is how it's prepared, and some of it has horseradish added. Some of it, um, if you if you just leave it sitting longer, if you if you reconstitute the Keen's mustard oh, powder, yeah. um, if you leave it sitting longer, the hotter it gets. And then you add an acid to it, a vinegar or or something like that, and it then that stops that that heating process. So it's 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 pretty complicated actually. It's like wasabi for me. If it's not giving you that buzz in the nose, it's not mustard, but uh, <laughs> each to their own. Uh, That's right. In any case, we've less that we only about 30 seconds. Is there any growth in Canadian actual prepared mustard, do you know, or is it mostly raw mustard and mustard flour? Yeah, typically we're exporting the seed itself mm-hmm. uh, or smaller amounts of the flour and and sometimes the prepared mustards. Um, and the difficulty is the U.S. is our largest customer. They've grown mm-hmm. record crops of their own the last couple of years. Sure. And so uh, we have a harder time exporting and Russia is exporting into Europe. So mm-hmm. we're we're facing some stiff competition there as well. This morning, we got a read of employment in the United States. Double, nearly double the amount of jobs expected were added to the U.S. economy in the month of January. It is leading to some question marks as to whether or not March is truly a live meeting when it comes to a rate cut. Yesterday, those bets got dialed up a little bit more because we saw some pain in the regional banks. Let's bring in Robert Kafsik, senior economist at BMO Capital Markets. Robert, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, why do we need rate cuts at all when we've got the U.S. economy just humming along at these levels, double the employment, as I mentioned, the most amount of jobs since January of last year, and, and unemployment still at 3.7 percent? Yeah, look, we've been in the in, in the camp all along that the market just got a little too ahead of itself, pricing in rate cuts early this year, probably pricing in too many rate cuts for 2024 as well. And we're starting to see pretty clear evidence now that that's proving to be the case. So not only did the Fed basically come out and 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 have chair powell tell the market to stop pricing in a march rate cut effectively in the press conference the other day and now a couple um uh, 300,000 plus uh, employment prints to to finish off january and come into uh, to finish off december and come into january that's again telling the market there's quite a bit of strength still out there in the us economy uh, so that's where we are right now we do we do think i mean to your original question we do think that there is still a case to dial back some of the tightening that's been put in the system because rates are still pretty restrictive if you look at where real policy rates are right now and the fact that inflation is coming down pretty steadily in North America. But given the, uh, uh, you know, the way the central banks want to play this, probably erring on the side of, of caution with respect to the inflation backdrop, it's, it's too soon for rate cuts right now. 
On the flip side, you did hear Jerome Powell in the press conference kind of sing a different tune with respect to how he's interpreting the stronger growth. He says, we no longer think, right, that we need slower growth in order to achieve our inflation goals. Um, what did that do to your modeling, if anything? Well, so our, our, our thinking here, and I think part of the Fed's thinking too, is that we are looking at rates that are at our, up at a very restrictive level. And we have seen inflation for, for various reasons come off, if it's in the goods sector, if it's, it's in the service sector as well. A lot of the core measures of UF and US inflation have, have settled down over the last three and six months. And Chair Powell was, was adamant that looking at the last six months of inflation data, the trends that we're seeing there on an annualized basis are good enough for the Fed to start normalizing policy. So, uh, you know, the hope here and the hope all along has been that they don't need to really break the back of the economy and, and create a, a more textbook cycle where we go into recession and that melts inflation away. The Fed cuts rates, rates aggressively. If you continue to see the kind of inflation softness or, or, or normalization that we've seen over the last three and six months, that, sh that should be enough for them to to kind of chase inflation down and get real rates back to a more neutral level. We've seen some headlines, some concerning headlines from select regional banks. It showed up in the stock market over the last two days, though today selling pressure in regional seems to have eased. How do you think about pressures building in the regionals, their exposure to areas like commercial real estate? Yeah, I, I think it's it's a symptom of the fact that that policy is in fact tight enough, and we have seen overall growth more or less slow down, inflation more or less slow down, um, and we have seen some kind of fractures in 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 the banking sector as well. We saw it early in 2023. We're still seeing it seeing it poke its head out a little bit here as well with what we've seen over the last week or so. So I think that's a symptom uh, of tight policy, and that you know the Fed probably takes that into account, and, and one of the reasons why. They're hopeful that we see some more good inflation number. They can start taking some of the tightening out of the system at this point. When you contrast um, the Fed's path and, and where it is, do you think it's likely that, that the Bank of Canada moves first with a rate cut? Uh, we So we would assume that at this point the Fed isn't going to start cutting rates until July. Um, we may be leaning a little bit earlier if, if the inflation data continue to run in uh, favorably, and, and the Fed is going to have you know three CPI reports, three PC reports by the time they get to May. So possibly they can set up a rate cut in June at that meeting if they want to. Our, our view has been that we're going to see them move in July. Bank of Canada looks pretty similar. We suspect that we have just more more rate sensitivity in the economy here in Canada. We've seen much much more sluggish growth over the last six months, even though the turn of the year is looking a little bit better. Uh, we figure they're going to be you know, maybe one step ahead of the Fed in terms of timing, but really not that much, much different at all. All right, uh, Robert, thanks so much for your perspective today, unpacking the macro. That's Robert Kapsik joining us from BMO Capital Market.